I'm very excited tonight to introduce Daniel Ames, um, who is a professor in uh, the management division of the Columbia Business School. Now, tonight's session is very participatory, and it's going to happen during his session. So I know Daniel's probably looking nervously at his watch because we said, yeah, we'll start a little after 7, and then we can go. We'll go a little bit over. Now it's like, what, it's like 15 or 20 minutes into, into his talk. Don't worry. We're going to go a little bit long on this session. I'm just warning us all. But because we've, Daniel's got great stuff for us. Um, at practice, we like to bring together people that come from traditional game design, like the, like the tabletop game industry or the video game industry. But we also like to bring in people from outside that we wouldn't normally think of as game designers. We've had, we've, uh, in past years, we had people in the, the, uh, the, the rules committees of professional sports organizations. We had someone that designs climbing walls. Uh, very memorable talk. Um, and Daniel is sort of like not necessarily inside, not outside, but maybe on the margins. He's trained as a social scientist. And I met Daniel because this year on sabbatical, he decided to attend all of our Games 101 lectures, which is our history lectures, fundamentals course that all of our BFA and MFA students take. And he was just sitting in to educate himself in games because he for years has done social science and economics research in the form of role playing games, but not within a game design community. And we're going to get a taste of that tonight, both to have him talk about it, but also to participate in an exercise that he's done many times before, and he's going to, and he's going to do here. Um, and um, just to give you a taste of the kind of things that he does, he, Daniel unfortunately has to not stay for the rest of the conference because tomorrow he is speaking at a conference of the economics of bargaining to an audience of economists. So, so he's really working in the kind of hardcore social science uh, arena, but, but he's kind of stumbled into, in, into games. And um, I, I, I think that I'm very excited to see what he has to, to share with us tonight. Um, and um, please join me in welcoming uh, Daniel Ames. Thank you so much, Eric, for that uh, kind introduction and for inviting me here. I'm really excited to be here uh, with all of you. I think this evening may be a little bit more fun than my time tomorrow morning with the economists. Um, but let me, uh, let me get right into this. And I want to start with a few stories that I think can motivate our thinking about this. Somewhere in America, right now, Two young sisters converge in a kitchen. On the counter is a single orange. And they look at the orange, and they look at each other, and they look back at the orange. And in an instant, they descend on the fruit. It's my orange, says one sister. I was here first, says the other. And a tug of war and a war of words commences. Halfway around the world, a 20-something Indian woman sits with her fiancé and his parents. Her soon-to-be mother-in-law implores her to wear a bindi, a traditional decorative jewel, during the prolonged upcoming ceremonies. She says she doesn't want to. What she doesn't say out loud is that she thinks the bindi represents a traditional patriarchal culture that she, as a feminist, resists. She also thinks she looks terrible wearing a bindi. And so the battle of the bindi begins. Back in the northern hemisphere, a video game designer is working on a passion project. Not long ago, she discovered that to realize her vision would require getting the rights to use someone else's audiovisual intellectual property. Her resources are a tiny fraction of the right holder's usual fees. But her initial email to them is charming enough that they agree to a phone call. She takes a deep breath as she dials the number. Can they find terms that work for both sides? There are two features of these situations, the sisters, the engaged woman, the game designer, that I want to stress as we begin. First, we live in a world of difference. Everyone wants their own thing money, resources, time, treatment. We all have our own point of view. We live in a world of difference. 
but we also live in a world of codependency. We have to cope with and coordinate with others to get what we want, to go where we want to go, to realize whatever our idiosyncratic impulses are. We want an orange for ourselves, or we want the freedom to not wear a bindi, and the rights to use someone else's content to realize our dreams. But the people we're dealing with, that we're dependent on, don't want the same thing. Sometimes we resolve or attempt to resolve this through power or force or violence. Maybe sometimes that works, but often enough, it doesn't. Thankfully, very often, we attempt to coordinate nonviolently. We get someone else to agree to us getting what we want, sometimes making some accommodation in return. That's negotiation. It's a basic feature of the social world, a world where different people want different things, and with some frequency, we talk things out with others to coordinate a solution that gets everyone on board. It's everywhere in our social lives. Here are the words of the game designer whose request for anonymity I'm honoring, but whose name virtually everyone in this room would know. Everything is a constant negotiation. I hear nearly the same thing when I'm talking to museum curators, or kindergarten teachers, or CEOs, or investment bankers, and nonprofit leaders. Negotiation is everywhere in our lives. It's, it's a pervasive part of the human condition. We're doing it all the time, and so we have you know, a lot of experience points in this domain. It's tempting to think, with all this experience, doing it around the clock throughout our lives, we would all have leveled up completely at some point. Uh, it's a daily activity, like washing your hair or making toast. Like, pretty quickly in life, you will have mastered this. But that's not the case. When I ask people how they feel about negotiation, 90% plus say they wish they could do it better. And even more than that, say they wish they could be more comfortable negotiating. For people like me who teach negotiations, this is great news, right? <laughs> this is fantastic. Uh, and there's room for improvement. We often say yes to deals that we should walk away from, or we say no to a deal that we should have embraced, or we get to a deal and we end up leaving value on the table, or we ended up wrecking a relationship that we didn't have to. Fortunately, there's a body of knowledge that's accumulated over decades, uh, including social scientists like me, as well as practitioners, professional mediators, and peace builders. Um, and there are important ideas. There's stuff you could know about negotiation that would help you be better at this. There's some book learning that could be done. But you know what the real engine of insight and development and progress is in this domain? It's not all the books. It's the action. It's the role playing. Stepping into a buyer role or a seller role or a job candidate role, entering into a fictional world with someone else and trying to bargain in that world. That's the engine of development in this domain. There are thousands of professors and teachers at law schools, business schools, public policy schools, and trainers who work in organizations around the world who teach negotiations using role plays. There are many hundreds of role plays available for licensing, um, though perhaps maybe a few dozen of these are kind of archetypal that really account for the majority of training. And tonight, you're going to do a negotiation role play. You're welcome. <laughs> no, no, okay. okay, but before we do that, uh, let me break the frame and just give a brief aside. I'm wearing two hats in this session, or at least I'm trying to. Uh, I've been speaking so far kind of as a negotiation scholar, negotiations teacher, and I'm trying to share with you some of what I say and do with my students at Columbia um, when I'm working with nonprofit leaders, when I'm working with formerly incarcerated women in Queens in a program that we do through Columbia. Uh, so I'm going to continue to wear that hat as a teacher of negotiations for a while with you. But after we debrief the role play, I'm going to switch hats, and I'm going to try to talk for a little bit about practice. I'm going to talk about me as a kind of experienced designer, an experienced builder, and talk a little bit about how I do this and what's in my mind when I'm trying to create experiences like this. And the hope is maybe some of that is relevant to some of your work. So let's get into our role play. Let me offer a few instructions 
and in a few moments, you're going to be in a group of people unleashing yourself. This, this goes back to Frank's comments at the beginning. The first piece of advice we had about practice was make friends with someone new. This is a chance to make friends or frenemies with somebody new. I implore you. So we're going to have a role play where you may be buying or selling, attempting to buy or sell a food truck. And somebody will be in the role of the seller. Somebody will be in the role of the buyer. In each group, there'll be at least one and maybe two facilitators, people who will be playing an active role as sort of a process manager and a kind of negotiation coach. So you're going to be in one of these roles, a seller, a buyer, or a facilitator. Here are the four steps that we ask you to follow to get ready and launch into this activity. First, form a team of three or four people. This is a chance to meet somebody new. You could bring a friend, but why not meet somebody new? That's one of the reasons you're here at practice. So form into a team of three or four. Either number works. Uh, grab a packet. We have some lovely people here. Tony, Kevin, Eric are all armed with materials. And once you have formed a team of three or four, you can flag one of them down. They'll give you a packet, and you can distribute those materials among yourselves. Whatever piece of material you get, if it's A, B, or C, that's who you are. You could trade these around, but that's how you'll assign roles. If there are three people in your group, you're going to have an A, a B, and a C. If there are four people in your group, you'll have an A, a B, and two people in C, the facilitator role. So circle up. Once you've gotten your group formed and you've gotten your materials, circle up in this room or any of the two adjoining spaces here. Spread out, move your chairs together, form a little cluster, get ready for this conversation, and then begin reviewing the materials. Everything you should need to know for this activity is in the materials. I'll be walking around uh, ready to answer any questions, um, but that's the process. Does anybody have any questions about how this works? The, uh, everything about the timing is given in the packets. Let me just end with these sort of overall sentiments I want to offer for the negotiators and the facilitators. If you're a negotiator, if you're in the buyer or seller role, please commit to the reality of this case. It's very unlikely that you are currently engaged in an ongoing negotiation for a pizza truck. <laughs> Throw yourself into that world inhabit that world, and we've got some guidelines for you. Everything you need to know is in the case materials, but please also honor and follow your facilitator's guidance within the law. Um, <laughs> facilitators, your role is really critical. You're not just a passive observer. You're an informed observer. You're a process manager. You've got a timeline in your materials that you're managing your team through. You're also a little bit of a negotiation coach. So you may be giving some advice based on your materials as things unfold. Facilitators, keep an ear out for me. I'll be walking around in the rooms giving you an idea of where we are in the timeline that's in your materials so you can keep your team on track. Time to make a new friend. And in general, when do yes. we want to come back here? Uh, we're coming back in about 35 minutes, so five after eight, I would say. Okay. All right. There so we go. If you have a group of three or four, raise your hand and I'll
this? Is that okay. okay? Okay, there won't okay, be any cool. sound from the speakers, and this should be good enough. It's just no. for the stream? Yeah. Okay, good. Oh, here. thank you. Oh, you're, you need a group? Yeah. Uh, is there anyone not in the group? One more? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'll do it. I'll do it. Who's the buyer and who's the seller? You're the buyer? I mean, you're the seller. Okay. Why doesn't one of you join this group of three? A group of three that needs one more? Is there a group of three? Right here? Here, here. Okay. That's rough. That's a lot of text. Uh, I have to make this.
they don't need to read the whole thing. We kind of do, but we can skip the appendix. I guess we're ready. Are we ready? We have an appendix, but we're encouraged not to listen. Um, I guess we should start. Okay. Sounds good. I guess you guys just try to agree on a right. You want to, You're selling a truck and you're buying a truck, so I guess make a deal. Okay. Right. Let's make a deal. <coughs> So, um, you're still in the truck after you looked at it? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's got some scratches and stuff, but it's got, you know, the kitchen inside is really what I care about. So, that's really going to set me up for my pizza business. So, that's great that you're doing the pizza business. It was designed for pizza. Mm -hmm. The, uh, you've seen how the oven is done the decks, if you will, for the pizza. Um, they can cook four pizzas at a time. You see that we have an ancillary oven that can store six pizzas, keeping it warm and moist. And this has been my heart for the last 10 years, but I couldn't do it without the results. Oh, I didn't, so, I didn't know you had a, this was your business. This was my business. This was my livelihood. This was my heart and soul. And uh, it's bittersweet that I have to give it to the in my life. But there it is. Um, it is what it is. So uh, there's an emotion. Um, there's an emotional side to this transaction uh -huh. that I can't avoid. I, I simply can't. It's, you see, it's in my driveway. When I look out my window, I'm going to see something in a big empty space. And that will be weird. Um, so you're not just buying a truck. You're buying a piece of my soul. And, and my home. And my dream. The perfect slice, right? The perfect slice. So, um, you're still interested. I am. I'm a, a young pizza entrepreneur. I, I haven't actually gotten into the business yet. I'm still working um, at a kitchen full time and you know, thinking about starting my own thing. And so, yeah, I'm just getting started and kind of seeing what my options are. And um, I saw your truck. And just driving by, and um, well, somebody told me about it. And I drove by and checked it out. But I mean, I think full disclosure, I heard someone was interested to contact in the restaurant business. Yeah. That's, okay. So, Maybe that's how I found yeah. out. Okay. And, um, the transition from being a worker in the yeah, excited and being your own boss, they're not related. It's, it's going from, you know, being an employee to being a sole proprietor. And the, the, the pride that you have and the joy that you have freedom, even though you're working very hard, you're your own boss. You decide to uh, give yourself a long lunch break one day. <laughs> so there's a lot of things that come with responsibilities, but also freedom in terms of uh, uh, financially you'll do so much better. Because you're an employee, you're, you're earning wages, and wages are continuing to go so high. <coughs> but this truck has been the potential to make as much as you want. Because if you wanted to work extra on the weekend, you wanted to hire someone to work two days a week, maybe on weekends. Possibility. So now, you, not only are you a sole proprietor, but you have to eat and, uh, and and all that. And yet, you can be sitting in your backyard, sipping lemonade in the shade, while someone is earning money for you. I personally never did that. I know, I don't know if I can afford that, <laughs> to have another employee just yet. Well, yeah. But, but after a while, yeah. Yeah, well, the thing is, you do the math, and you figure out, okay, I can either work this myself and, and make $2,500 for the weekend, <laughs> yeah. or hire someone else, and they get a cut. Yeah. They so, get a cut. Uh, Facilitators might propose uh, want to put some numbers on the yeah. table so we know what we're like talking about. Right? So, uh, do yeah, somebody have? Do you have a risk price? Do you have an offer? So I, 
I know that probably go into the pit like this and go anywhere from 35,000 to 40, or maybe even lower. But what he is behind this kind of way. Yeah, and that would be one that might be maybe a year old or something. Yours is a little older than you. But it's not about the news, it's about the quality of the equipment. I mean, is it a stone, brick oven pizza with an ancillary morning pizza? Hand crafted with parts from stonemasons in Maine and hand crafted iron doors. Do we, do we have a deal? Are you guys ready so, to make a transaction? So, so, What's the so, so, so the thing is, is that to my from my point of view, forty thousand is the base because I can't go lower than that. It's your, it's I mean, I've seen the other ones that were fairly comparable for a lot of thirty-five. Um, they, they can't have the detail that that was put into this. I I designed it. Mason, with a lifetime of experience making nothing but pizza ovens, and, and this gentleman who lives in the woods of Maine, creates ovens that have a soul. In the same way that this, this business is not crazy, he's oven has a soul. He almost does a blessing when he finishes it. So rich, I have actually helped him go to the ovens. And, uh, I mean, are, are you are you interested in the truck? I mean, do you want to make an offer and see if you've got a deal? I mean, I've been looking at another truck. I mean, it's not, it doesn't have this nice equipment, but it, it's kind of an empty canvas where I can feel exactly what I want in it. Because um, to be honest, like, this kitchen's great. There were a few things I would change about it. I wanted to rearrange um, the way the ovens were, the countertops. But, um, what would like? What would you pay for this? Um, what would you be willing to pay? I was thinking like probably thirty thousand. Have a deal? I can't even honor that as an incredible offer. It's like we don't have a deal. Um, all right, so. We're supposed to stop around now, I think, yeah. uh, for the five-minute pause. Yeah. And so we're supposed to ask you to write down somewhere on your materials a word or phrase that reflects your characterization of what's happening so far. You got a moment. So first, just jot down somewhere like a word or phrase that you think captures how. I'm going to go to So far, I think it's, this negotiation is not good. It's not going great. Kind of stalled out? It's not going great, but it's not healthy. What, um, what do you think, why, why do you think, so you suggested that it might be because of the emotional attachment, maybe that's part of the problem. What do you think, why is it stalled out? Because I'm trying to make a I don't know in my head. Yeah. And she's not close to me. 
like mm -hmm. the bottom of that. The bottom okay. of that. So, and is a way out of range for you for what you want to spend? So there are other ways we can come to an agreement. How so? How do you think? So we could work out a deal with you pay thirty thousand dollars for the job. But because that's not really what it's worth, you need to negotiate some other way to compensate me for the work that I put into designing the car. So the machine that I put up is built up. He's really into this. Is, 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 I'm starting to want this pizza tough myself. No, I'll, I'll make it all. <laughs> so, so, but the, yeah, so, so, um, uh, <coughs> deal the rounded corner so that you don't bump it. Quick. Okay. Uh, so, you think that there are possible solutions We're here. still out of character right now. So yeah. You don't now, need to be as invested in the patina. Now, do, do you think, I tend to agree with you that I think there actually are solutions that are mutually, event, that like, that, that work out for both people, um, but it seems like there are things in the way of arriving at that. Um, now, it says here that you guys might have, might have like special goals or something. Like, did you guys have additional goals? What, what were those? Did you have, oh, in addition to like, buy, yeah, buying a truck at the right price, um, were you? Mine is just to win the negotiation. You wanted to win the negotiation. What about you? What, what, what Were sorry, you given no, a special goal yeah, of some yeah, kind? Yeah. Yeah. Strong, strong. Okay, you're already going to show that you're a strong. Okay, so the theory is that that these additional extra goals might be hampering the ability to actually hammer out a mutually beneficial solution. So at this point, you're allowed to kind of just like put those aside. So up to this point, you've been like playing a role in a sense, and now you can like let go of that extra goal and see if there's just even just a, like a quantitative solution that's just purely like works out for both parties. So maybe begin again and now without any additional ulterior motive, see if you can arrive at an agreement that works. So, I have Every year I do a community and we have a weekend event where I go to a park, they throw a picnic for four lines, and they invite a lot of community. And I have the spaces, I make $25 on the dollar. But it's not just the money, it's, it's being part of the community, giving back as well. And I've got relationships with virtually everyone in this group because I've done it for 10 years. I'm going to propose that. We buy the truck at said price. But for the next 10 years, I could take that truck. If you've taken your mid play pause, it's about time to start the negotiation. Let the negotiation make the conversation. Not you, not your employees, not your suppliers, nothing. It would keep my hand in it at a very minimum. Uh, how much does that, how much revenue does that generate? $2,500. 2500 bucks. So you could allow him to generate, or you could just give her the contract. Right? Then that's an extra, that's extra income for you. That's, those are both possible things, right? You could, but I don't have the same connections and like the relationships. But if I could do that, that's actually taking away from her office, taking her offer less. Uh, her offer is still a thousand dollars. Now I'm throwing in a connection that can generate another twenty five hundred dollars. It's a reason for her to pay you more. It's a reason for her to pay you. In other words, you could give him an additional two thousand. You throw this thing in, which is worth twenty five hundred per year. Per year. Oh, per year. So maybe think about that. Like maybe that's worth. That's a. That's extra. That's that like an. Ex, you know. That's extra revenue that might be worth paying for. 
it's true, but I have very hard. Uh, and this is not something you're going to get to continue uh, getting as revenue once you sell the truck to whoever you sell it to, right? So in a way, it's... Yeah, but if I sell to her, and we have an agreement where I get to work this event once a year, then... Yeah, that's true, too. We break that in. That. Yeah. Um, you, could, you could keep the money and lower your price. No, but I, the, the, the idea that the 30000 is, is below what I'm, yeah. I'm asking for. So to compensate for that, give me two days a year for the next 10 years. Or we can make it five. Because I want, right. I want to... That gets you pretty close, right? Yeah. You deal with And so, what do you think? Five years, 10 years? I mean, you know, let's try for five years. Because I, I probably need to do, do it for 10 years. I mean, that works for me. That helps it stay in my budget. And, like, two days a year is not too big of a sacrifice. Yeah. It's a week. Yeah, I can take it. Right. So I think we have a dream. Is that, a, is that, does that work? Yeah, that works for me. Okay. Wow. <laughs> They'll be happy to have it. Swift resolution. Read the appendix. All right. Now we're going to read the uh, appendix. I think maybe that's just us. I think this is more of our secret information yeah. into both of your lives. So did you craft a distance point? I believe so, yeah. generates some extra revenue and then, um, one of them was parking so you're expecting to pay 4200 bucks a year for parking yes and you potentially I think you currently park the truck in your driveway that would have been up another place to Oh, you never heard no. anything? No. Does it say that you park it in the, your driveway? Yeah, that's all. That's all, but it's, uh, yeah, it does say that's that, but it says I need it. The idea is I'm moving to the southwest. I'm going to sell the car, retire, and move to the southwest. I think it said something about... Oh, yeah, um, maybe move in a year's time. Yeah, you're going to so move, you're gonna move a in a year. year. So you're going to keep this, the, you're going to have this driveway for a year. So, so, it also says I need electricity in the driveway, so I wouldn't know this soon. Yeah. The, driveway the third one was commissary and prep. Apparently, the That's buyer, the yeah, the buyer, so you've been paying $4,200 a year, uh, $350 a month, to use the community center as a commissary. Oh, that's a lot and less than I would And you were expecting to pay a lot more. So this is another place where your connection and your relationships uh, might have led. They did. They no. They they locked it in. They, they should have. Yeah. The the deal was. What was the final deal? <laughs> I think five. I heard five. I heard five. Joy Wait a minute, stop everything. Two days. Two days. Two, five, I heard five years. You, do you agree yeah. there was five years? Yeah. Because that's five times 2,500 is like to, oh, a little over 10, 1,200 bucks. Or a little over 12,000. 
and that's the difference between your bottom if you wanted 39 and, and, and 30. It says here that your upper range is 33.5. Yeah. And yet so I, I heard 30. I never heard 33 from you. I heard 30. Seriously. Yeah, yeah right? You didn't budge. No, you really did it. I was supposed to do this drum negotiator. Well, I figured if I said 30, you would say like 5 Yeah. Well, I said no. <laughs> Ah, uh, that's funny. So yes, yeah, so that's a good deal. Now you have to fly back to do this again. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And it's yeah, and you're getting if it's twenty five hundred times five, it's more than ten thousand bucks. It's a good. I was doing that for ten years. Yeah. And I relented because you know, so if I be here for ten years, you'll be. Oh, you've been doing this, making and eating pizza for the past 50 years. You're in great shape. So, so, this, so this truck has a stone oven? It says a brick oven? It was high and dark. It's a oh. No, it's a, no. You're embellished on the scenario or you're embellished on what the truck actually No, it was a stone Okay. Do you have a liquor license? Was that part of the scenario? No. No, you can't sell beer out of this truck? You can sell beer out of any truck. Unless you're lucky. Because you can get a drink in outside. Unless you're lucky. Yeah. It was just a New Orleans restaurant. So, do you drink outside? I did drink outside in Orleans. It's kind of the thing. Exactly. In, in, the styrofoam yeah. cup? I didn't have a, I had a plastic. My friend made me get oh, yeah, a hand grenade. Nice. Ridiculous. Oh, boy. Yeah, it's not enough to be drinking outside. You have to be drinking outside in a ridiculous yeah. vessel. Yeah, it was, it was like a county Says fair. Everyone, look at me. <laughs> it was definitely like festival style. Carnival style. <laughs> Well, congratulations on getting your deal. I feel like as negotiators, we should take a piece of the difference between your your high range was thirty three five, your low was thirty nine. So that's a six thousand five hundred dollar range. I don't know how to fairly compensate us. What should we take? You made, so you ended up, let's look at it this way. From your perspective, you ended up making the difference between 30 and 33.5 is $3,500. So from your perspective, you profited $3,500. You're walking away, let's say $3,000, because these weekends are going to be a pain, but clearly it's good, right? So you basically made $3,000 on the deal. You are getting, your, your low price is 39 and you're ending up with 30 plus five times 2,500. So that's 42, 42 five. So from your perspective, you made 2,500, sort of. Like, let's say $2,000 plus. So did you make two or three? 35. So, so your profit was basically, your profit was basically, I made mean, three thousand. Your profit was basically two thousand. No, we will we we'll round it down. We we'll round it down because the five hundred is sort of like so. So you guys actually made a lot of money. We put it all together. How disappointed are you? No, I like the facilitator role because now I'm going to negotiate the facilitator fee. Because so you guys actually profited overall five thousand dollars between the two of you. I think we should get ten percent of that each. I think. <laughs> 500 bucks each. That's a small, that's a tiny fraction of the money that you make. It's a little bit late. They've already got their deal. Uh, here's my, okay, that's a good point. Time, but the next time, Listen, uh, let me put it this the way. next time you need negotiator. Yeah, let, you were definitely not obligated to pay us any. Because we did not make an agreement. However, I would say that 
It seems fair. Right? In the spirit of Yeah. Yeah. Five hundred bucks. Yeah. Are you willing to give up five hundred dollars? To the negotiators? Yeah. You really made a lot of money. You, you did better than he and and Yeah, I'm trying to buy a rat I can help you get the best price on that. You've seen what a good negotiator I am. Okay. Yay. Okay. So there you go. Congratulations. What would you have done if you don't like you said no? I don't know. I would have had to probe into that refusal a little bit. Why are you being so What was? Well done. So it turned out it was too easy to get him to sell his soul. When was the last time you had to negotiate something? Did you have to negotiate anything recently in real life? Last two nights ago. What'd you do? What'd you do? What'd you do? I have all the I see a pair of shoes. I said, how much? He said, 15 bucks. How much is it? Yeah. And the guy looked at me and said, 10. I said, thank you. So, good line. That never worked before. Wow, that's good. Usually people just laugh and then they yeah. say, 15. Yeah. They didn't know if it was like other people. Welcome back. Please find your seats. Please find your way back to your seats.
If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap two times. All right, that always works. My mother was a kindergarten teacher, so picked up a few things. Uh, and I'm going to keep on my teacher hat for the moment uh, as we take a little bit of time to debrief Perfect Slice and talk a little bit about what was going on in that case. And then I'm going to put on my experienced designer hat um, and reflect a little bit on how I create and run role plays in the hopes that maybe something in there is interesting and maybe valuable for some of you. So, Perfect Slice. Welcome back. You survived a little time in that fictional world which some people find amusing and others find infuriating. Um, hopefully you made a new friend or frenemy in the process of doing that. How many of you felt stuck initially when you took the break in the negotiations? So some of you somewhat, but many of you and some are like, reaching your hands up super high. I felt very stuck. Many people get stuck when they are put into this negotiation, even without any particular guidance. And we're going to talk about the guidance the players had in just a second. Uh, one reason is because of what the structure of the scenario looks like. It looks like the buyer can't pay more than $33,500. They want to get it for a lot less than that if they can. That's their limit. And the seller won't accept less than $39,000. And they want to get more than that if they can. Um, and that's a pretty big gap. I'm a psychologist. I'm not a mathematician. But I don't think there's a number that's $33,500 or lower and also $39,000 and higher. Uh, I don't think that number exists. And so when you look at this problem that way, this is an impossible problem to solve. We call these, in negotiation language, we call these negotiating positions. They're on the surface. They're the things that people ask for, the, the deal terms that they want. Uh, I'll give you $30,000 for your food truck. I want 42. Those are positions. They're on the surface. And when you look at this from the point of view of positions, they're incompatible. These are not compatible positions. How did you characterize your first phase of bargaining? We asked you to write down a word or phrase when you took that pause. Can I just hear a couple of the phrases or words you wrote down? Just shout them out. Yeah. I don't think he has enough money. I don't think he has. A, so presumably, this is a seller saying, why am I working with the world's poorest buyer? OK. <laughs> Others, what, what did you write down? Yeah. Beat the other side. I'm going to cream them. All right. Others? Yeah. Not going great, but not hopeless. OK, so not giving up yet. Keep, keep hope alive, right? Like, it's not going great, but may, we're not done yet. Yes? Greedy. Greedy. Was that a characterization of yourself or your counterpart? Myself. OK, good for you. <laughs> you know, self, uh, you know, being honest with yourself is the first step for that. Uh, yes? Professional standoff. Professional standoff. So in the sense like it felt like it was professional, yeah. but there was a real gap between the two sides. So sometimes people say this ends up feeling a little bit like a standoff, like a kind of a battle or a fight, a zero-sum war or tug of war. And some people think when you get into that kind of situation, it's time to reach for the dirty tricks. Right? If you have a counterpart that's not yielding, they're not giving you what you want, it's time for you to pull out your bag of dirty tricks, your arsenal of gambits and stunts, uh, whatever you can do to outwit or bludgeon or dupe your counterpart into agreeing to a deal that works for you, that's attractive for you. Sometimes when I teach a negotiation course or a workshop, uh, people start to realize they're not going to get a whole list or arsenal of dirty tricks. And then they're very depressed about that. And sometimes they want their money back because they think that's what I'm going to give them. Uh, and I just don't think dirty tricks are necessary to be an effective negotiator. Let me ask this. How many of you reached a solution without dirty tricks? How many of you got a solution? OK, so very few people are saying, I did it with dirty tricks. Many people are saying, I got a solution, and I did it without dirty tricks. And many people also found a solution without inventing some new number that they didn't do the deal for 30 frim thousand, right? <laughs> they didn't invent some new mathematical space. Rather, what ended up happening, usually in this case, for teams that find a deal, is they come to see the situation in a different way. They dig into what we call, not the surface level positions, but the underlying interests, the real deeper motivations, the problems the negotiators are really trying to solve. The buyer doesn't have a $33,500 or less problem. They really have a, I need enough to start my business problem. The seller doesn't have a $39,000 or more problem. What they really have is, I need enough to retire problem. And when you can see these real underlying interests, 
your understanding of the situation changes, and you can seek an approach that gives each side what they need. It isn't an impossible problem to solve to figure out how can you create enough for the buyer to start up their business and allow the seller to retire comfortably. The seller's goal in life is not to wreck the buyer's startup. The buyer's goal in life is not to destroy the seller's retirement. Sometimes you can win in a negotiation and get what you want and allow the other side to win as well. But to solve this problem, you have to see this problem. And that means you have to have the right kind of conversation, a conversation that's probably different from the one you might have started with, especially if you were really embracing the goals we gave you. We threw some role blocks into this case. We asked you, based on your birthday, to embrace one or another of these goals, to win the negotiation, to not get played by your counterpart, to show that you're better than your counterpart at bargaining. And you were good sports tonight, uh, enacting these goals, even though they weren't your own. Or were they? For some of you, right? Believe me, these are very human goals that a lot of people fall into. I've fallen into embracing each of these goals at some point in my life. And for some people, they really are habits or lifestyles. One of the things I study as a psychologist is narcissism because it's awesome and hilarious to study. And the way narcissists define success in many negotiations is to beat the other side, to win the negotiation. That's a habitual goal that they bring, a lens that they bring to these situations. For many others, we might slip into these temporarily because we're afraid or we're angry or we're upset or we feel like we're under attack from a counterpart. When you're in one of those mindsets, you're often stuck with positional bargaining. It's really hard to have an interest-based conversation. But when you can get to those underlying interests, when you can set aside some of those mindsets, then you can start to integrate other features into the deal. And those of you who got deals probably added something like some of these things into your deal to bridge the difference. And this is perhaps the core lesson of the perfect slice case. To find value, to solve your problem, you need to have the right kind of conversation. This leads me back to one of my favorite writers on the topic of negotiation, a woman named Mary Parker Follett. She was writing in the 1920s about negotiation and conflict and organizational life. And her prose is as clear and lucid and hilarious as anything that's been written over the last century. And in her time, she was almost entirely ignored because she was a woman writing in the early 20th century about conflict and negotiations and business. But this is what Mary Parker Follett said. If we think that integration is more profitable than conquering or compromising, in other words, if the way forward isn't just to demolish a counterpart or completely capitulate and give in, but instead to try to find a solution that works for both sides, that's what she means by integration, then what you have to do is bring the differences into the open. Bring the differences into the open. And what she means is, what is the seller really trying to achieve? What is the buyer really trying to achieve? She's saying you have to bring the differences into the open so you can see the real problem, not the $33,500 problem, not the $39,000 problem, but the real problems they're trying to solve. Bringing those differences into the open. Follett is also the source of the example I gave at the opening about the sisters in the orange. And she tells this story in her writing from almost a century ago. One sister says, I want the orange. And the other sister says, no, I want the orange. And back and forth and back and forth they go. And what do you think happens to that poor orange? What would they do? Let's assume there's a not, like, no humans are harmed in this scenario. <laughs> Just the orange. What do you think happens? That orange gets cut in half. But it turns out one of these sisters just wanted the orange so that she could zest it and make orange cake. And the other sister wanted the orange because she wanted to juice it to make orange juice. What could they have done? Yes. Right. And did they get that? Did either sister get what they wanted or needed? One sister got half of what she wanted and half of something she didn't want. And the same is true for the other one. If they could have just switched up, you can have the entire rind and zest the whole thing. And in return, I want all of the juice it would have been possible for each of them to get everything that they wanted without compromising. But they needed to have the right conversation. They needed to have a conversation that in Mary Parker Follett's terms brought the differences into the open. What about the Battle of the Bindi? 
that I talked about at the beginning. This one didn't seem easy to solve at first. You can't split the difference and wear half a bindi. That doesn't really make much sense. But eventually the woman and her fiance and his parents were able to have the right kind of conversation to get the differences into the open. For the parents, the ceremony was a chance for them to connect with friends and to affirm those connections and their values. Their goal wasn't to make the bride miserable. And for the bride, her goal wasn't to damage the parents' connections. She just wanted to feel comfortable and enjoy herself at her own wedding. And with this out in the open, they were able to find a way forward. The bride would wear a bindi for part of the festivities where it would be most meaningful for her in-laws. And the rest of the time, she would be bindi free. We can also close the loop on the other example I gave at the beginning about the game designer. It quickly became apparent that her budget wasn't remotely close to what the rights holder typically commanded. If the conversation got stuck on price, if it stayed at the level of surface positions, the agreement never would have happened. But their discussion went deeper. They brought the differences into the open. She described her vision and her desire to honor the content so that she wanted to license. And the rights holder shared their interest in being exposed to new audiences. So they were able to find a deal that was within the designer's budget, and she was able to realize her dream. Let me finish talking as a negotiations teacher by summing up a principle that comes out of the perfect slice case, illustrating what Mary Parker Follett wrote nearly a century ago. When you're in a conflict or a tough negotiation at an impasse, like the sisters with, an or with the orange, um, ask why. Dig deeper into the underlying interests. Seek a conversation that brings the real underlying interests into the open. So let me switch now to a second hat. So I've been talking as a teacher in a sense, and I want to switch briefly to talk a little bit as an experienced designer and builder. Um, I know how little I know about game design, and I'm humbled by how hard it is, and I don't pretend to be an expert. What I'm hoping is that I can say a little about what I think about when I'm creating these kinds of experiences, to talk a little bit about my practice, uh, and try to draw some questions out of that that might apply to game design. Perhaps something in here can be useful for some of you. So let me turn to a few principles that are on my mind when I'm designing role plays and experiences that come out of my own uh, decade plus of doing this. And this relates to what we've experienced tonight with Perfect Slice. A first thing I want to highlight is just this idea of what I call conflict templates. These are like lenses, frames for interpreting and dealing with differences, with conflict, with negotiations. Uh, and there's an important dimension here that sometimes we can see a situation as being really a zero-sum, win-lose situation. Other times we can imagine mutual gains, a win-win situation. And different people in different situations evoke different sorts of lenses. And those lenses shape our expectations. They shape what we pay attention to. Uh, the inferences that we draw, the interpretations we make, the decisions we make, and the actions that we take, how we define success and the path to it. And they vary tremendously from situation to situation. I think many people here would be familiar with the classic prisoner's dilemma situation. Uh, not long ago, a team of social psychologists put a group of participants uh, through a prisoner's dilemma situation where there were choices to compete and cooperate and there was a temptation to defect in your counterpart. So if you cooperated and your counterpart, if you competed and your counterpart cooperated, you got a great payday. But there was also uh, punishment for being a sucker. If you cooperate and they compete, you lose money. And they were paying this, uh, playing this for real money, many rounds with many different players. Um, and the payoffs were always the same. But the experimentalists changed one thing, the name of the game. For some people, they said, you're going to play the Wall Street game. For other people, they said, we're playing the community game. Same payoffs, same situation. The only thing that differed was the word they used to name the game, the label of the game. When it was the Wall Street game, they got about 30% competition. Um, oh, sorry, cooperation. About 30% of the time, people cooperated when it was the Wall Street game. And the community game, it was double that, more than double that. Same payoffs, just a different frame, just a different lens, a different conflict template was activated. Um, the name effects were hugely powerful powerful, and they were far better than the predictions people made about their own behavior in advance, or people who knew these participants made predictions of their behavior in advance. That was all swamped and washed away by the effect of the name of the game. I think about this when I'm writing negotiation materials, like the perfect slice role uh, case that you did tonight. I make very 
deliberate choices, or at least I try to, about how I describe who the other person is. When I first started writing role play materials close to 20 years ago, I realized that most cases that I read and that I started writing myself described your, uh, the other person as the opponent. And that's a conflict template right there. Right? That's a frame that evokes a certain kind of uh, interpretation. Uh, I moved on over time to partner because I was kind of rebelling against opponent, but it turns out maybe that's going a little too far in the other direction, sort of signaling that this person wants to be on your side, and they don't always. Eventually, I moved on to the more neutral term counterpart, and hopefully that's what you saw in the materials tonight. So even these labels matter, and this stuff varies from situation to situation. It also varies from person to person. People have some stability in the lens that they walk around with that they use to interpret an ambiguous situation. So there's a whole tradition of research, I'm not going to go in depth on, but uh, called social value orientations, where scholars work very hard to um, characterize people's uh, preferences for kinds of outcomes. And they often categorize people into these three buckets. Pro-socials, and across populations, about 60% of people are pro-social, where they want to maximize their outcome and the other person's outcome. Individualists are indifferent to what their counterparts get. They only respond to where the most payoff is for them. About 25% of the population are individualists. And about 15% are true competitors. That they're happy to even get less themselves as long as they got more than the other person. They want to maximize that gap. Maybe those are the narcissists. So there's good evidence that people also have these stable conflict templates that they walk around with. And one of the common challenges in negotiation is uh, that we're dealing with a, a template often called the myth of the fixed pie. The people come into a case like the perfect slice and they see it's going to be just about price. And it's a tug of war. It's a zero-sum game. And role plays like the perfect slice explore this. They often lead people to confront and recognize their own templates and sometimes revise them. I try to leave room when I'm creating a role play for people to bring their own assumptions and fill in some of the gaps because then they'll realize different people filled in those gaps differently. And when we step back and have a collective discussion about it, they'll start to see their own assumptions more clearly and sometimes end up changing them. Uh, there's a pro tip here that I've seen as well. As I see people evolve and develop as negotiators, they start to not only recognize their own templates, they start to pay a lot more attention to their counterparts' templates. And they realize the way for me to move ahead depends on how you see this conflict. And sometimes they try to diagnose that, and sometimes they try to even manage that across the table. So some questions for game design that might come out of this. You might think, how do your games play with various conflict templates? Do they draw them out, activate them, subvert them, shift between them? What cues, like those labels, like those terms, do your games give for which template should apply? Where there, where's their ambiguity for players to express their own default templates? And what are the consequences for different templates? And what are the boundaries for those kinds of consequences? Time permitting, I think I want to talk about one more principle, but I'm happy to Cut it short in yeah. light of our agenda? OK. Uh, so one more principle that I'll note here, um, and that you see in play at the heart of the perfect slice case and in many negotiation role plays, information asymmetries. Uh, when different players know different things, and then there's a payoff for discovering what your counterpart knows, or maybe pooling your information with your counterpart. This is kind of essential for negotiation role plays to work. If the buyer and the seller come in knowing everything about each other's situation, it's not terribly fun or interesting. So buyers knew different things from the sellers. Um, many factors can inhibit pooling, the sharing of information. You assume that everybody knows what you know. Or um, there's a lack of time or attention to do it. In some situations with competitive dynamics, like a lot of real world negotiations or conflicts, or a role play like Perfect Slice, this can yield an information dilemma. And this is the kind of social dilemma that's at the heart of so much of what we're dealing with in negotiations teaching, and I think in real life conflict. So again, we're back to this two by two, a like a prisoner's dilemma, but now the choices aren't cooperate or compete, but it's about sharing information, about being transparent. I could withhold information or I could share it. My counterpart could withhold information, they could share it. And you can imagine what the consequences would be. If we both hold everything back, maybe we miss an opportunity to be creative and do something cool and valuable. If we both share information, Maybe we could find a win-win, a creative win-win. Of course, if only one of us shares and the other doesn't, there's potential for exploitation. Now, this is part of what was going on in the Perfect Slice case. 
only if the two sides found a way to have a conversation where they brought the differences into the open and shared some of that could they actually find a deal. Otherwise, they would likely end up in an impasse. A thing to note about this is you did one case tonight. When I'm typically teaching a full semester long course on this, this is one of perhaps 10, 12, 15 cases our students might work their way through. So they're going through a whole arc, a whole journey of cases. And one of the things that I observe is their experience going through that ends up changing their minds about how they think about this information dilemma. Um, here's some uh, survey results from a recent class that I taught. I asked them at the beginning of the course a handful of questions. Do you agree or not? Being unpredictable puts you in a better negotiating position. We have a very prominent advocate for unpredictability in the United States right now. And so this is kind of putting this to the test, right? Being unpredictable. At the beginning of the semester, uh, a lot of people are saying, yeah, you know, that's a pretty good thing to be unpredictable. At the end of the semester, it's considerably lower. How about transparency? A kind of related notion. The more a counterpart understands what you think, the better off you are. At the beginning of the semester, only a quarter of people think that. They think that's, that's a horrible way to negotiate. You should keep your cards close. You shouldn't reveal anything. By the end of the semester, well over half of people embrace that idea. They endorse that idea. I didn't tell them this. That's never been on a slide. It's not a, a good practice that I hand out to them. They discover it in the course of doing a whole sequence of role plays around things like perfect slice. So um, what are some questions for game design that might flow out of some of these thoughts about information asymmetries? How do your games distribute information across players? Is everything all out in the open and everybody knows all the same things all at once? Or is it asymmetric? Is it parceled out? How do your games signal how information is parceled out and distributed? Is discovering the existence of asymmetric information a part of your game? Could it be? How could information asymmetries and the discovery and resolution of them maybe serve your game or your goals somehow? Those are a few of the principles that I wanted to highlight tonight. And for the sake of time, I'm going to jump to the end and we may have a few moments left for questions and answers, but believe me that I'm eager to hear from you and even if we run out of time for our formal comments tonight, I will be here hanging out and we'll be happy to hear your reactions and entertain any questions. But let me just close by saying this. Um, I hope some of what I've shared tonight has been interesting, maybe entertaining, maybe a little bit of both for you. Uh, I want to end with an invitation that this work needs you. The game design community has a lot to contribute. Most people in the world of negotiation training don't know a lot about game design. Uh, as Eric uh, noted earlier, I'm doing my part in my own sort of ignorance reduction project, attending Games 101, things like that. I found it humbling and fascinating and fun um, to start to get to know some of this world. I think negotiation and conflict training matters a lot. That it can enrich people's lives, and I don't just mean their wallets, I mean their relationships and their well-being. Um, I think it's one of the most important things our species is teaching itself right now. And you can help. Some of you could think of ways of doing this that are beyond anything that I or my colleagues could imagine. And I hope that you will. Thank you very much. Thanks, Daniel. And I just want to say, just to, I didn't really finish my introduction of you, but I think that you sort of did it for, for all of us. I talked about how we met initially uh, in Games 101, and, but what I didn't say is that then we, we, we got together a few times, we had lunch, we went out for a beer, and what I found is sort of what you presented tonight, which is that one way of thinking about game design, there's not one or uh, one right or wrong way, but is, is that we kind of sculpt and play with desire. Mm. And I think that human desire, it's one of the least understood things by game designers and by humans in general. And so I think one of the, one of the things that I love about hearing you talk about uh, your work tonight is that you're, you're making that kind of invisible world visible, mm. but with, with, a, with a kind of rigor and clarity that is like listening to music and you feel like the air becomes visible in a certain way. So I just really want to thank you for that. It's very provocative and, and I love the way that you 
you kind of set things up, you sent us out, and then you brought us, you definitely brought us home. Um, let's take some questions. I would just love to hear any questions about either the content or even the exercise. Yeah. Uh, so thanks for the talk, that was amazing. Great. Um, my question is about negotiations as it pertains to more than two players. So mm -hmm. when you're in a situation mm -hmm. where you're negotiating from person to person, you do the. I, I do agree that the the tendency is to go from like winning or losing. Mm -hmm. But I I found that some political games that uh, help out with there's an aversion to negotiating, and some players feel uncomfortable about even starting negotiations. Hmm. Do you have like any sort of information about opening people up to negotiations when they they feel uncomfortable? Because I think the one stigma that I hear a lot on those games is that yeah. I don't want to feel like I'm that you know that that sly person. I don't want to like, you know, bamboozle you. And there's like, a, I feel like there's sort of those players that feel really uncomfortable about negotiating. Because they almost have a fear of being taken advantage of? Yeah, of, like they, they feel that once they open themselves up to negotiations that you step into their arena and they can't, yeah, they can't. But you're also talking yeah. about sort of in-person games, right? Yeah, beyond, in beyond, games. beyond two players where the social sure. dynamics become sure. more complex. So, I mean, I guess my brief answer to that would be one thing you can do is put multiple offers out on the table, right? This is a common technique that we teach uh, of an approach when negotiations get stalled. And it's not necessarily about multi-party, but it's about when your counterpart almost doesn't want to engage or doesn't trust you enough to engage in negotiations. Sometimes what you can do is say, look, here's plan A and here's plan B. And I can't exploit you. But if you like one of these, please say yes. And sometimes that just jump starts the conversation and gets them to think, well, neither of those works for me, but maybe they'll come back and propose plan C. And it's almost a way of sort of priming the conversation to say, I want you to look at these resources as fungible and that we could explore trade-offs in these resources with each other. And I'm open to creative solutions. Even in a uh, zero-sum situation? Like when uh, everybody's in a situation where there's only one outcome but it, it, it's like an impasse where you're like, everyone has to sort of team up on a person, and one person's like, oh, do that, that, feels really scary. that they don't want, they don't want to team up yeah, on somebody. Yeah, somebody. <laughs> so, some people are reluctant to exploit the weak, but they just, you know. <laughs> Samantha, yeah. I love this, thank you. Sure. It, 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 it strikes me as a sort of inverse or total opposite of popular games like Avalon or Secret Hitler, mm -hmm. where the entire game is built around this this very idea of withholding information mm -hmm. because you have conflicting goals. Mm -hmm. So one, I want to say thank you sure. for like this to me pierces through that that mm -hmm. like very idea that we need to have conflicts with each other by withholding information at all. Mm -hmm. What I want to ask is, right, so I have Secret Hitler as a, it's like a narcissism generator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Machine. It represents sort of what, at a tabletop capacity, what so many games and, and games mm. most video games do, which is mm -hmm. that in order for me to win, someone else or everyone else has to lose, right? Like, look at the popularity of Battle Royale games, right? Mm -hmm. like, I won and 99 people lost. Right. So my question is, like, how, what are, what are, and it, maybe this is a bad question, but what can we do to, to facilitate better the possibility mm. of mutual success right. with, you know, ostensibly enemies? Yes. So I think it's a great question. And you know, sometimes when we get to the end of a negotiation course, I've taken a group of 40 or 60 or 80 people through a 12-week journey, and they've all you know, smoked a lot of Mary Parker Follett, and they're all like, well, let's bring the differences into the open and come together. It's going to be great. Uh, and, and then they realize, like, wait, we're going to have to go out into the world and negotiate with people who haven't had this course and who are going to try to eat our lunch. And what do you do? And I think one sort of glib but sort of true thing is to say about this is it's really hard to convince someone to do something because it's in your interest. Sometimes the way to engage somebody else, especially a skeptical person, maybe a competitive person, is to, say, to try to show them how it could be in their interest. So saying like, look, if you can work with me in this way, if you can share with me in this way, we can be transparent with each other, if we can be predictable with each other, here's what's possible. And here's the payoff for you. Now, it turns out there's a payoff for me, maybe there's a payoff for lots of other people as well, but sometimes the way I have to reach that intransigent, cynic, competitive, combative person is by really just making the case for how it pays off specifically for them. Mm -hmm. But it's also that in a game, we need to rethink what the victory conditions are. And we almost need a payoff matrix where it's sort of like there's like nobody winning 
everybody winning and some people winning as the you're sort of you're sort of negotiating this meta space of possible end conditions that's right. um, as part of your play of the game. Mm -hmm. But that's hard. That's a hard thing to design. Mm -hmm. All right, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. What? No? no, 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 no one else was raising their hand at that moment. <laughs> Although there's a couple uh, others behind, yeah, yeah. You have, uh, when you run this game, yes. uh, do the facilitators ever like negotiate a little fee for the <laughs> <laughs> He says as a facilitator, right? <laughs> little points on the back end. Uh, here's the thing I'll confess. I've never run it as I did it tonight. Yeah. I felt like for this group, with a large group like this, I'm actually enlist your help as facilitators because I feel like uh, it's in the uh, wheelhouse the first, of the people in this room. This is the first time you've had facilitators? The way I will do it is if usually I'm working with a smaller group yeah. and I will be the facilitator. I'll send people off, I'll stop it, we'll talk a little bit about what's going on, and then I'll remove those goals and send them back in. Because Jess and I made a, uh, made a little something. Good on for on you. Our, our <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So hold on, let me, let me just check. I'm just gonna make notes, Frank. Wins Let's perfect get slice. Let's get. 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 Let's
So sometimes sellers feel like they're powerful because they have the thing, they currently possess the thing, they can decide to sell it or not. Um, I find that there's a lot of interesting idiosyncratic things that go into feeling powerful or feeling weak in a negotiation. But I feel like to me, many of the most basic critical drivers cut across so many different kinds of contexts, whether it's a job negotiation, a house negotiation, a food truck negotiation, or a licensing negotiation for a joint venture. That many of these same things, the information dilemma, the conflict template dynamics, those emerge across all of those contexts. Yes? I think, uh, I, I was thinking about what, I, what we are doing there. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about if it was play or not. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, what is I think I heard you laughing. I think yeah. it was a game, but then I didn't think <laughs> of what kind of game it was. Right. If it would have been a competitive game, yeah, then we would, we would have been not getting anything. Because mm. it's two players, I can get no benefit out of the negotiation if I cannot win. Right. If you say it is a cooperative game, we just. There's no limitation. We give all, all information that solves the puzzle. Right. No. Right. <laughs> so we did something different. Yes. Yeah? It was kind of the one time experience of negotiation. Right. Like in whatever, uh, probably in the escape room game mm -hmm. or. <laughs> yeah? It felt like uh, something different. Yes. Because the negotiation part in two players does not work. Right. You need a third player to get a negotiation of two players' benefit mm -hmm. against. It's all about the setting in this world. Yeah. Make it but I don't know if it's a question, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> right. it's, it's, because it felt like a good, act, good right. activity, it felt like a game. Good. Right, in part what you're saying but is that... that but you're, but right. when you say competitive or cooperative game, yeah. those that's the labeling issue that, da yeah. that Daniel brought up, right? right. That, 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 that label could have easily determined the, right. the right. over-determined game. Was that, then, then the game would be <laughs> right. It, it, it takes a lot of work to refine the language that gets used in the, the materials because in a sense we're planting a bunch of clues that if it was really out in the open from the very beginning that like, well, you've, you could do the catering and then there's this other event and then there's the commissary and the park. And if all that was spelled out too clearly in the materials, then people would be like, okay, two minutes later, we're done. So it needs to be there for people to work with, but it needs to be woven in in a way that it's not initially entirely obvious. And then you add some of these very human kind of dynamics and the guard goes up because you don't want to get exploited by your counterpart. And now you don't want to share any information with them. Now that adds another level of complexity with that. Uh, yes, wow, lot, lots of hands. Let's see. Um, I'm, uh, yeah. Uh, I was Then we'll go to Sam. So I was wondering, uh, in the role of Jesse Jr. class, do you mm -hmm. do things like negotiating custody agreements or splitting up a different class of parents belonging? Mm -hmm. If you do, like, how is that fundamentally different than the ones that involve money? It's a great question. Most of our negotiations that we're teaching at Columbia Business School sort of fall broadly in the business realm. Um, I've done negotiations in other contexts, in nonprofit contexts, when I teach workshops where we'll get into other things where like aesthetic concerns or ethical concerns are at play. Um, and again, it's not to sort of trivialize those distinctions, but I think a lot of the same human impulses and the challenges of having the right kind of conversation apply across those domains. I think when you add in these uh, values, um, when I talk with museum curators, like aesthetic values are an overriding concern for them. And so when they're negotiating with colleagues, like that, when that gets activated, that's a tripwire for them. Um, when I'm working with certain nonprofit leaders, uh, their service mission is sacred for them. And when that comes under attack, that's a tripwire for them. So one of the ways it's different is I think there are more tripwires in some of those situations that can set off a cascade of emotions that can make it harder to have the right kind of conversation. Let, let, let's, I hate to do this, but we have the floor until 10.30. So w what do we think? We want to take a few more questions and then I want, also want to give us lots of time to, to mingle and interact too. So let's, well, yeah, let's, let's have well, one more question. Go ahead, Sam, yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak a little about the process of actually making the situations. Yeah. Like, I guess in my head I'm sort of imagining you write these out them with other negotiation teachers, and then you're in the situation where like, we need to pretend that we don't know how to do this. Yeah. <laughs> we each other, but not quite, and then I'm just wondering, like, what that will cost us. 
Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is like the, you know, the practice of play test that, that, that you do. Um, I can't do it with other negotiations teachers because they just like, oh, you're doing this. This is like a rewrite of that, and you mashed it up with this other case. Like, this is so derivative. It's like, okay, thanks. Right? Uh, so, you know, so a lot of it is taking like naive people, people who haven't done this. My son, my teenage son, is a phenomenal proofreader of these things. He went through a lot of these materials today, and then he's coming at it from a fresh point of view and can give me that feedback. So that's what, you know, I'll sit down and I'll play test this. I'll get a buyer and a seller and I'll just watch them read it and I'll see how the conversation unfolds and then I'll know I made this too obvious for that person and that wasn't obvious enough and I'll go back and rewrite it. But I'll usually start from what, kind of what experience do I want people to achieve, right? The sort of feeling of hitting the wall but then having success, right? How could, I, how could I get that? And then I'll start to think structurally about what are the issues or components in the case. And then very quickly, this is kind of what I was saying in my talk, I'll start to think about how do I parcel out the information, which is such a critical part of creating materials like these. How do I parcel out the information to each side so that it's, it's a little bit of a puzzle for them to unlock, both personally, them reading the materials, and also interpersonally across those two sides. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Let's thank him for an amazing kickoff to practice.